We're going to talk with an old friend and a former Major League great catcher, Clyde McCullough. This is a big weekend in Chicago with the Hall of Fame game coming up and a lot of great names and great figures in baseball coming into Chicago. I think the first thing that, uh, Clyde, that the uh, listeners would like to know is, what are you doing now? Well, I've been retired for four years, Bob, and uh, I'm taking it easy and uh, uh, really with my grandchildren. i got seven grandchildren and uh, never had much time to spend with my kids, but I'm having a good time with my grandchildren and going to the beach and swimming and and uh, working with high school ball players and college ball players in that area. Well, that's uh, rewarding, isn't it? Yes, it is. Uh, it's a satisfaction. What do you, as you look back on your own career, what are a few, in your opinion, of the highlights of your own performance? Well, getting to the big leagues is, was my highest performance, I, which I never thought I would. And uh, after I got into the big leagues, uh, it was just great. Uh, you have to work harder when you get here than before you before you got here. And uh, that's what ball players don't understand today. Uh, when you get to the highest, that's when you really got to work harder. Well, and, and a few highlights. Uh, I think, uh, I hate the word I, but I was the first catcher in the history of the game to hit three consecutive home runs in a row in a nine-inning ball game, if that means anything. Yeah, I'd say it does. <laughs> and, uh, and I started two, uh, two, three triple plays as a catcher in the National League. Started them on, on bunts with a man out first and second. And uh, uh, that's a couple of things. There's, there's probably more. And, and uh, of course, I always uh, talked about throwing people out, catching in uh, the arm. I, uh, I'm thrilled over that, that I did have a great arm like Hardnett. And uh, I took a, a probably one of the greatest catchers of all times job, Gabby Hardin, which you were announcing. Yes, that's and, right. And uh, that's uh, those things. Uh, I remember those things most. And, and above all, uh, these great fans we have in Chicago, too. I miss those people. Yeah. Well, they really are wonderful. You know, when you talk about catching, catching is really the name of the game. You see it all back there. You sure do. Uh, uh, I just met a couple of fellas here, and I said catching is the most fascinating position on a ball field because everything's in front of you and that's why you see so many catchers managing in the big leagues and managing uh, they can teach and they move the third baseman's over on a change of pace to let the infielders know and the first base with the left hand hitter up there right hand hitter you just reverse it you you change the right fielders and then on these hot days bob uh your your ball club on these hot days your your, your ball club your pitchers pitching five innings then after they pitch five innings I don't know whether you people ever knew it or not. Then we change. Then we, we, uh, instead, the first five innings, we play them to hit to right or left, uh, reverse the hitters. Then we play them to pull after the first five innings. And that's up to the catcher to, to make that mind up and tell the manager, we've got a shift. <laughs> Clyde McCullough, as you look back on your baseball years, who are a few of the fellows that ran on you? Well, you I got away with it. I don't know. It, it, <laughs> it was only 73 bases stolen on me all my years in baseball in, in, the ba in the major leagues. And the majority of those fellows were hitting and running. Uh, one of the, two of the greatest base runners I've had the pleasure to throw out, and they stole ba some bases too, was Lonnie Fry. People don't believe this. He wasn't fast, but he was a great base runner. And Pee Wee Reese. I had no, I had no, I had no trouble with uh, Jackie Robinson at all because he gave it away. He, he gave, tipped it off. He tipped it off. When he had his hands on his knees, he was stealing. When he had them off, he weren't. And these <laughs> things you have to pick up. <laughs> well, did that word get around the league? No, we, we uh, I didn't. I didn't even tell my pitchers. I didn't tell my ball players, because you know they talk. Well, how's this guy pitching out when he when he knows I'm stealing? Uh, maybe the the manager changed the signs. The Rocha changed them all the time when when uh, in Brooklyn, and. Uh, and one day, Leo asked me, he said, how in the hell do you throw this guy out every time he goes? I said, I don't know. I, I'm just lucky enough to call for a pitch out. <laughs> you never told him the secret. Of course not. You're the first man I've told that to. <laughs> and I won't use it. <laughs> oh, you can. <laughs> oh, that's great. What about some of your favorite pitchers that you call signals for? Well, I, I caught so many of them, Bob, uh, uh, great ones. Uh, Back in those days, you know, we only carried nine pitches. There weren't any relief pitching. When I first came to the big leagues with the Cubs, uh, Big Bill Lee, Larry French, Charlie Root, uh, uh, Claude Passu, 
uh, uh, Maloney, Guy Malone, Bush. Guy Bush. I mean, those people, uh, I know Cleveland had a great pitching staff over there in, in uh, 54, but this was the greatest pitching staff I think was ever assembled. I'm not speaking because I'm a national leaguer. I worked in both leagues. But this pitcher, we had uh, a starter relieved a starter. And, of course, you know that pitching staff over there. You announced those White Sox games with, with Cleveland, uh, Garcia, and, and Fella, and Lemon, and those, those those fellas. They were great. But I, but those, they yeah, spent so many relief of pitchers standing right out here. Hodelman. Uh, 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 <laughs> what, one of the better ones, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> oh, I, I, I think, I think today, today's baseball is so live today. That's why you see pitchers not finishing the ball games because you've got the Astro, the infield, and all that business, and only a couple of grass infields. And uh, I, don't, I don't see how these pitchers pitch six or seven innings. And they say, well, this fellow had completed the game. That's why they're playing with that live ball. Back in our day, we played, uh, it was the same baseball, but it was a dead of baseball. And, and, and you saw more bunting in those days, and you saw more drag bunting, more sacrificing. Mm -hmm. Today, today, and I, don't, I know the, the manager's second guess, but I, I don't second guess it because it's tough to bunt on this, this hard turf today. Mm -hmm. And you take now, we used to sign infielders, we had the short infield. And now you got to play these hitters on the AstroTurf like softball. Your third baseman's way back, and your shortstop's way back, and your second. And you got to have an outfielder's arm there to throw across the infield. I'm just talking deep yeah. baseball to you. Were you uh, catching for the Cubs uh, when Dizzy Dean came here? I caught Dizzy Dean, his last ball game that he ever pitched in the big leagues, uh, and I also room with Dizzy. Uh, we know he's gone, and we all miss him. He, he was a great one. And, uh, you know, he hurt his arm, and... Uh, and uh, his beautiful wife, Patricia, I, I see her every once in a while in uh, Jackson, Mississippi. And uh, we really miss Dean. Uh, he, was, he was a great one. Diz didn't have any curve balls. He just threw the ball by you. Yeah. He, and he, he threw a rising fastball, and he pitched everybody inside. And he weren't afraid to pitch inside. And that's why he struck all those people out. And, and you know, it's, it's a funny thing. Uh, nowadays, you, they, they're afraid to pitch inside with a fastball, and, and that's still the best pitch in baseball. Because uh, when we sign a kid today, he's got to throw 80% fastball because you can't go out there and throw curve, curve, curve. Your, your arm will fall off. You know, our mutual friend Dizzy Dean and I, we killed vaudeville here in Chicago. We were at the palace for a week. Oh, gee, I didn't know that. Yeah, well, we killed it. It was dying, and we killed it. Well, you know, you were a band leader anyway, Bob. I mean, uh, you could cut it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I really had quite a time with that guy. I really loved him. Uh, he's a beautiful man. Uh, yeah. uh, I remember uh, they traded Collins and Ken O'Day and, and Warnicky for, for Dean, and, and uh, that's after, I believe, he hurt his arm, but he was still... He still pitched good ball for the Cubs. Yes, he surely did. Our guest uh, today, and we're delighted to have him, is a former catching great Clyde McCullough. We'll be back with our guest in just a moment. We're talking baseball with an old friend today and a fine, outstanding major league catcher, Clyde McCullough. Clyde, I know that, like, like I do, you follow the game very closely because you love the game. You notice any notable changes in the game today? Well, there's so many changes in the game. Uh, uh, Player-wise, we, we had our great players back in those days, and we got our great players today, only they play the game different. Uh, uh, you got bigger gloves, you, you, you got snatches, we call it. Uh, uh, I just got through talking about that. First base, the catcher's mitts number the first baseman's mitt now. And you got better ballparks, newer ballparks, Better, better facilities, you fly everywhere, and uh, somehow or another, uh, the ball player today should be very thankful that they're playing in this area because they, they're getting the benefits from everything, and they should be dedicate themselves more, I think, to the game. I'm a dedicated man uh, uh, in this game, and always will be, and I, I would like to see more dedication coming from the ball players. Did you think ever think that you'd see the time when a ball player was making six or seven hundred thousand dollars a year, there ain't a man in in, in the world worth a hundred thousand dollars a year, include the president. <laughs> that's a that's a quick answer. All the, all the stars I've ever seen in the sky, they're not down here. We only have human beings. Yeah. Well, you're right. Some of these some of these salaries seem seem a little bit out of line when you stop and figure that it's a nine man game. 
It's not like a golfer who does it all by himself or somebody else, a billiard player. Uh, a ball player is only one of nine guys out there. That's true. They make more. Uh, they get more meal money than I made. Now today they get fifty-two dollars a day for meal money. I, I didn't make fifty-two dollars a day until I was in the big leagues fifteen years. What was the meal money like in those days? Uh, three and a half, three and a half dollars a day. So you'd sleep through breakfast. Well, you uh, we, eat lunch. We were playing all day ball then, Bob. Yeah. I mean, you, uh, your breakfast was your main meal, and you ran out of money to eat dinner. You'd have to save some money to have a couple of beers, you know. <laughs> you mentioned the great uh, catcher and a great Chicagoan, Gabby Hart. Oh, he was a great one. <clears throat> yes, he was. And uh, I shan't ever forget when the when the Cubs bought me from the Yankees, and I came over here, and it was just a sight for sore eyes to see the guy play. He was yeah. he was outstanding. Yeah, he really was a tremendous ball player. I can see him just like you say you did. Yes, he yeah. he did everything well. He uh, he was just a, and on top of that, he had character. It goes a long way. Yeah, he was really he was really something. He was outstanding in my in in my book, uh, and of course uh, Jimmy Wilson took his job here, and uh, uh, I was very fortunate. I I caught under some great catches from the American League and the National League. I caught under Allen. Uh, who gets caught for the White Sox, and uh, and Steve O'Neill, man of Detroit, great catcher. I was very fortunate catching under these people. I took a little from each one of those fellows and put it into my ability and uh, scratching, and uh, and finally came out all right. Uh, you know, as you look back on catching in baseball, there's only been one catcher in history who caught from a sitting stance. You know who that was. Jimmy Archer. Yeah, I, I, he, I he stayed down all the time. I didn't get to see him. Uh, uh, I, I know. Well, he must have grown up with that from a kid, throwing from that. But uh, I'll tell you, uh, nowadays, and even when back in the forties, fifties, and the thirties, when I was playing, you couldn't do that with these base runners. They they were too tough. They they'd get those leads off this pitch, and you wouldn't have a chance to throw them out, Bob. Uh huh. I mean, that, that's my opinion. I wonder how how he did it. He was uh, he had a great reputation as a catcher. Well, he, he was a good one. It was unfair. I didn't get to see the fellow play, but I saw a lot of great ones play in Cochran and Dickey and Steve O'Neill and Hemsley. I'm, I'm naming you some outstanding catchers. Uh, uh, Lombardi. Uh, uh, yeah. I can uh, both leagues. I mean, uh, uh, back in those days, we only had 16 ball clubs back in those days, and 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 why baseball isn't up to par today. And and because you got 24, 26 clubs and it's spread it too thin. Back in those days, uh, we had 16 clubs, and and each club, even the last place club, was tough to beat in those days. Bob. <laughs> uh, you're right. It's been a real pleasure talking with you. Uh, nice to see you again. Thank you. Many happy memories about. Thank you. you. God bless. Thank you. Thank you a lot. We've been talking with a former Cub catching great Clyde McCullough. We'll be back in just a moment. We're going to talk with an old friend and a former great pitcher in the major leagues, Art Houdeman, who was uh, quite a pitcher in his day. In fact, he was a member of one of the greatest pitching staffs ever assembled. Remember those days, Art? Well, there were some good ones with Detroit, but when I went over from Detroit to Cleveland, I was able to join a pitching staff that included the likes of Bob Lemon, Mike Garcia, Early Wynn, Bob Feller. We had Newhouser that year, too, the one year. My goodness, it was a tremendous. We had two young, strong bulls for relief, Narleski and Mossy, one right hand and one left hand. They could fire a ball by them all. Yeah, it really was a perfect pitching staff. If you could really pick whatever you wanted in a pitching staff, there you had, and you, you just mentioned the fact that in relief, they were both great, the right-hander and the left-hander. Well, the beauty of it was the fact that you, as a starting pitcher, you figure go five or go six, when these fellows weren't getting much work in the bullpen and you had a couple run lead, Lopez, the manager at the time, he would even take the starting pitchers out of the ball game to bring these kids in to keep them sharp. They'd, they'd throw them. And these hitters wouldn't get a chance to see them but one time. See? And they just rear back and pump, and oh, my God, they could throw. It was, it was really beautiful. <laughs> that was really something. What's, what's the big change in the game? From your time to today, well, outside of the obvious, the money, I would say that the it's it's attitude. I do believe that your athlete today is probably a little stronger, a little faster, but their thinking is completely different. Uh, 
I don't know. They they seemed like it's like the youth of America today. It means like somebody owes them something. Everything they take, all they're given. And I mean, they're not misjustified in taking the money that's being available. And if the owners didn't think they're worth it; they wouldn't be paying it. But I think they got the handout all the time, and they're not too much willing to to give back of themselves. Well, we know what some of these enormous salaries are today. What was a big salary in your time? Well, anybody could make. Uh, forty, fifty thousand dollars was an extreme star like Feller or someone like that. And at the near the end, I mean, a hundred thousand was a tremendous thing. Now today, my good, I think the average pay on the Detroit Ball Club, which is not known for being overly generous, I think eighty thousand is the average pay of their ball players. The meal money today is one thing, and the minimum, the minimum today, the ball player today is making an excess of what I made in my best year. What is the minimum today? Well, it was twenty-one something at this point, but I think with the new contract they just agreed to, uh, they come in to start next year. It's thirty thousand dollars. Thirty thousand. That's where you start. If you're just a rookie off the farm, that's it. You're getting thirty thousand guaranteed. And meal money today? Well, I, I, I really don't know. I mean, they could be anywhere thirty, thirty-five dollars a day. <laughs> but all concessions, everything, every they fly everywhere. No overnight train trips. No nothing. They don't know what a train is. I don't begrudge the ball players that. That's all well. That's progress. But uh, they really got it made today, and uh, they they take it. Uh, the only thing that bothers me is not the big money, it's not the athlete himself. But I think it's the attitude they take it with. They take it like someone owes it to them, like they earned it. Mm -hmm. They're just right people in at the right time, just like anything else. Yeah. Aren't they say that every pitcher's had a, a one club that they had particular success against? Was that true with you? Yes, I, I well, I seem to do better against the better ball clubs and the better hitters and the mediocre clubs. I'm going to go back and say I can mention the St. Louis Browns now because there's no way for anybody to haunt me there. It's, they've dis no. But uh, I did well against New York, I think for a couple of reasons. I think it's like the competitiveness of it. You give out a little bit more. And the ballpark in New York favored me. I had good enough stuff that I could keep hitters on us, and I had pretty good control of what I was throwing. New York, you have a long center field, long right center, long left center. The mound was always comfortable. The shadows were in favor of the pitcher. It was just the whole thing I found to my liking, and I had very, I was very fortunate there. Who, who came to bat for the Yankees in those days? Oh, Charlie Keller, Tommy Hendricks, Joe DiMaggio, Phil Rizzuto. Pretty good hitters. Not bad, not uh, bad. They were, they were, they were great hitters. What did you try to do with DiMaggio, who's still a legend? I was very fortunate with DiMaggio. I honestly believe he looked for more than what I was throwing because uh, I think he got like seven hits off me all the times I pitched against him. And uh, he did me the honor of mentioning me as one of the toughest pitchers he ever hit against. And really, uh, it's, it's a strange. I don't know why, but I, I think it went long, along with the Yankee syndrome. I was fortunate against them. And DiMaggio, he seemed to be always looking for other than what I threw him. And very fortunate to say that. Yeah, but he was certainly one of the great hitters of all time. Oh, he was pictured. Ted Williams, of course, by probably the best. Then you got to say DiMaggio right there with him. What did you try to do with Williams? Make him pull the ball. <laughs> I didn't want him coming back through the middle because he was going to hit the ball. You had to pitch him down to keep the ball from being elevated. He, you get the ball up a little bit, and he elevated. He could hit it out of any part of the park, right, center, Left, it wouldn't make any difference. And, and uh, I even fooled him one day in Fenway Park. Fooled him with a change up, and he hit the ball in the net in left field. He <laughs> was a great, great, just whatever he did is that's the way you should write the book. Believe me, he was just perfection. Well, I I have always maintained that he was the greatest student of hitting and pitching that I ever ran across. He used to stand in the dugout or get over back of the screen and watch pitchers throw and especially during a ball game when he wasn't batting he'd stand there and he'd be watching the pitcher see if he could find some little quirk or some little flaw that would tip off what the pitcher was throwing well i don't think any pitcher ever dominated williams i would say he was a dominant factor up there when there was a contest between a pitcher and he and i don't think he ever took second best you might get him out and you might get him out reasonably regular but you come up in the ball game. he's the one guy you didn't want to have to pitch against. He was the best. <laughs> what do you call one or two of the highlights of your career? 
Well, I came close to pitching a couple no-hitters. One of them that was outstanding was when the, I pitched against uh, Cleveland. And I went eight and two-thirds innings. Went to the last man. And we had the ball game well in hand, 13 to nothing. We hadn't won a ball game all year. Started the season out with 12 straight losses. I'd been in the service the year before. Got a no-hitter going. The only pitch I called was the pitch Simpson got a base hit on. I shook the catcher off, and I threw my pitch, and he singled. That's I remember that one. That kept me out of the Hall of Fame. <laughs> no, no, no hitter. I don't think any club has ever had a greater pitching staff than you fellas had at Detroit. Well, I mean, I was just such a kid at Detroit when, this, when Newhauser and Trout were having their heyday. I mean, they won 54 games between them in 1944, I believe it was, they, 29 and 26. They were the one-two punch, and they, they did a tremendous job. Great pitchers, both of them. Uh, Cleveland, when you went over there, my goodness, we won 111 ball games, if you remember, back in 1954. That's still a record, and that's in 154 games, not 162 that they played. We only lost 43 games all year. <laughs> Yankees won 102 games that year, and they were a, they were a poor second in the league. We won 111. 111 games. Right. Had three 20 game winners: Lemon, Win, Garcia. All won their 20, 21, 22 games. Uh, I had 15 that year. My whole argument with Greenberg, who was general manager at the time, was, I said, Hank, I won 15 ball games. I said I started 14 ball games less. Than the big three. Now, if I had started those ball games, I'd have had my 22. I want to be paid. He says to me, he says, you know, you had the second worst earned run average in a ball club. I says, no. I said, what was it? 3.02. That was the second worst in the ball club. <laughs> Never did win one with a general manager. They always had the final word. <laughs> oh, those are really wonderful memories and days that I recall too. And I broadcast many of the great games that you pitched. Right, and you also got very involved with a fellow I broke in with that should be here today, Billy Pierce. Now, Billy and I were roommates, and Billy's three months older than I am, see? So I can say I was the young kid in the ball club. I never let him forget that three months. <laughs> I saw Billy the other night in an affair, and I'm sure he's going to be here today. You know, for a mild little kind of a guy, I'm sure he never threw at anybody. Well, he's one of those sneaky guys, you know, you know, he's nice, he butter wouldn't melt in his mouth, he's so sweet, but uh, Billy was a fine competitor, and he was a good pitcher, he pitched, you don't pitch for 20 years without having something. Did you ever pitch against Dean? No, 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 no. Dean was before my time, like I say, I was, Billy and I both, we were the same year we graduated from high school, it was 1945, the, oh. the war had just finished, and they had spent a little money on us. And they didn't have a farm system in Detroit. Uh -huh. So they kept us with the major club. And there were fellows on the ball club who probably were there a year or two longer than they would have normally because of the shortage of ball players. That's why the, the differential and the, the age of a number of them and the fact that we overlapped back to that time. But we weren't really, shouldn't have been there. But it was darn nice to be there. Well, I should say so. Great way to start your career with a World Series pennant winner. Gosh, I should say. Well, baseball is just a wonderful game. And... It's still the same. Three strikes is out. Four balls is a walk. The positions are still the same. Outside of the turf and the designated hitter, there isn't too much change. But they do make a great deal of difference. I mean, that turf is one thing. I mean, you don't have as much of it in the American League as you have in the National League, but it's like playing on pool tables. I personally think you ought to have a different set of records because it's got to add, to a fellow hits a ball on the ground, it's got to add at least 30 points to his batting average. Mm -hmm. And a designated hitter, my goodness. I, I don't think I'd have been a pitcher if I wouldn't have been able to hit. I'd have had to go to some other position. The fun of the game is in the hitting. <laughs> Artist, mighty, mighty good to see you. What are you doing now? I'm still pitching, but only verbally. I'm in sales. I've been with the Paragon Steel Corporation in Detroit uh -huh. for t almost 20 years now. And uh, we've got a few other athletes or ex-athletes with us. Ron Kramer, formerly football. Green Bay, and uh, he he tremendous athlete, All-American. Uh, he's in the Hall of Fame. Uh, Dave Bing, former Piston and yeah. Boston Celtic basketball, yeah. he's with us. So we don't get too far. We <laughs> different sports, but it's all the same. Plenty of chance to talk over old times, huh? That's it. Well, we're too busy with today's trying to hustle a, an order here and an order there. It's all you get involved with what you're doing rather than what you did. 
Thanks so much for being with us. Lots and lots of luck to you. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate yeah. it. Our guest, a former